Hi everybody, uh, welcome back again to Rip and Lodge Historic Site. Today we are sort of following up on our first post on World War II uniforms and video, and sort of their distinctive character and nature of uh, Army uniforms. So in the first video, uh, we had a naval officer's uniform, but we didn't have an Army officer's uniform for display. Uh, and so what I have beside me uh, are a uniform you might remember from the first video, uh, the 70th Infantry Division uh, service coat. And then I have a second coat here that is an officer's coat. They're kind of here uh, for visual comparison to each other. Um, one of the most eye-catching things, potentially, uh, to the camera is the difference in color. Uh, the officer's coat is much darker, almost kind of a chocolatey color, uh, rather than sort of the olive green. Uh, and another thing that's a little bit harder for the camera to pick up is the difference in texture and quality. Uh, this is a privately purchased, uh, tailored uniform uh, made for the officer that ordered it, William B. Bailey. Uh, we'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, whereas that is a more standard enlisted men's coat they could have expected to receive um, from the Army itself. Um, now, the other thing that compares and contrasts well here are the features of the uniform. The 70th Infantry Division jacket we talked about in the last video, um, and it's pretty complete with what you should expect to see for almost a full set of proper insignia, um, ribbons, and patches. And this officer's uniform is similarly fairly complete. Uh, we have collar insignia here, um, upper and lower, which is the unit markings even in the upper arms of the artillery pieces. Uh, and this is for the coast artillery as opposed to the field artillery. Uh, it has a ribbon bar. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Uh, and it also has, of course, uh, braid around the cuffs to indicate as well that it is an officer's uniform. Patches on both shoulders. We'll show those up close here in a second. And then it also has the proper uh, distinctive insignia that that uh, coat is lacking. In this case, for the 184th Field Artillery. But again, we'll talk a little more about that in a second. Um, kind of a variance you won't see on a whole lot of uniforms. The officer's insignia, in this case for a second lieutenant, a uh, single gold bar, is embroidered. It is actually sewn directly onto the uniform shoulder strap, as opposed to being a pin like the other insignia. Now, what also makes this uniform fairly distinctive, uh, in addition to its completion, and having a label on the inside that does indicate its original owner was W.B. Bailey, um, is that while that coat continues to be something of a historical mystery uh, and confounding who its original owner was, um, Mr. Bailey is an excellent example of what you can potentially uncover with the sources available to you online. Now, part of that is the physical characteristics of the uniform. So we have numbers, we have a 319 there, so it's the 319th Coast Artillery or something like that. We have these distinctive insignia on the shoulder that have a history all their own. Now, if you happen to have a uniform that still has those unit insignia pins on there, it can be a big help. Uh, in this case, the uh, Institute of Heraldry, United States Army Agency up at Fort Belvoir, they are sort of the designers and keepers of all of these official unit insignia. Um, now, their website, uh, which will be linked in the description below, uh, is fairly user-friendly. If you have uh, an idea of what kind of unit, potentially, like in this case, we have artillery cannons on the uniform, um, it can be helpful or it cannot, because this insignia on the shoulder was originally authorized for the 8th Illinois Infantry in the 1920s. The 8th Illinois Infantry in 1940 became the 184th Field Artillery. And then in the middle of World War II, the 184th Field Artillery was split up and subdivided and became the 184th Field Artillery Battalion and then two other additional artillery battalions from its original units. In addition to that, from the 184th Field Artillery's men was created the 795th Tank Destroyer Battalion. 
So all of these units came out of that one parent. And if you're confused listening to this, that's understandable. Uh, Army lineage, there's a good reason there are specialists that try and keep track of that whole tangle of things. But it does give us a starting point because the 184th Field Artillery was a National Guard unit, in this case from the greater Chicago area. Um, and in this particular case as well, it was a segregated unit. It was almost all made up of African Americans, uh, officers, enlisted men, um, almost the whole unit. It had served in World War I as the 370th Infantry. And that gave us something of a clue to look for, because knowing that this individual had a connection to the 184th Field Artillery, I was able to use a publicly available source, um, two of them. One of them is a, uh, is a subscription service. Um, you can use it from the county through the library system. Uh, it is not available from your home computer. Unfortunately, you do have to be present um, either at Relic at Central Library in Manassas or another library computer throughout uh, the Prince William County Public Library system to access that account freely uh, with your library card. But the other is Ancestry.com. Um, that is, as you may or may not know, uh, presently available for free from your home computer through the Prince William County Library System. So there's a link down at the bottom uh, taking you to the page where you can find access to that. Uh, you'll need the number on your library card. And from that page as well, if you don't have a library card, you can register for a digital library card that will allow you to access that as well uh, for free for the foreseeable future. And if that access does go away from home in the future, it will still be available from county library computers. So with those uh, items of information in mind, I was able to use uh, newspapers.com um, using the name in here, W.B. Bailey, that he served in the 184th Field Artillery. And I was able to locate several newspaper articles referring to a W.B. Bailey, who was a private in the 184th Field Artillery. From that point, I was able to connect him uh, to his hometown uh, in Edgemont, South Dakota, uh, and to where he lived in the immediate years preceding the war in Reno, Nevada, uh, and then where he eventually died back home in Edgemont. Um, Mr. Bailey was a uh, African American. He was a one of the pioneering ranchers of that part of South Dakota. His father had moved there from Georgia in the early 1900s. He had traveled all around the country as a young man, as many had during the Depression years, had served in World War I, had served in the regular United States Army briefly, and in 1940 volunteered again for service. So I mentioned he was a private. This is not an enlisted men's uniform. He did indeed uh, attend officer training school in Utah, was commissioned as a second lieutenant, and as you'll see up close in a minute, I mentioned the 795th Tank Destroyer Battalion, which was created from that uh, National Guard Artillery Unit. On the right shoulder, sometimes called the Combat Patch, or the former Overseas Service Patch, is the Tank Destroyer Command Patch, worn by those units. Now, the 795th did not go overseas. It was waiting for shipment to Europe when the Army decided um, to en masse disband most of its African-American combat units. That included the 795th. They were converted into the 319th Barrage Blue Battalion, which was a coast artillery unit. Found from there a news article referring to his service at Camp Holland, which was the training facility for the anti-aircraft artillery and barrage balloon training in Tennessee, and then his discharge in 1944, uh, likely owing to his age. Uh, again, he was born in the early 1900s, well into his 40s, and uh, because of the Army's segregated policies at the time, was still only a second lieutenant after uh, years of military service. So when the Lieutenant Bailey came home, uh, this uniform probably went in the closet, um, stuck around until he died in 1999, uh, and then went through several dealers' hands before uh, it came here. Now, uh, Lieutenant Bailey, um, we're lucky. You can't really expect to find a lot of that information. The fact that we have two contrasts here, there's a lot of detail, a lot of information physically on that uniform as well, and there's still no person tied directly to it. This one, we're somewhat lucky. Uh, Mr. Bailey left a... Uh, a name tag inside his coat, at least with his initials, 
And we were able to sort of piece that together from there. Um, he did a series of interviews with the Rapid City, South Dakota paper in his later years, talking about his life and experiences. We even have an image of him. Um, but you can't necessarily expect that with everything. Um, the best case scenario is that, yes, uh, whoever's relative you have, um, family member, uh, or just a curiosity you've inherited that you're wondering about, uh, you might not be able to find that information. In fact, you probably won't. This is something of a rare case. Uh, but it is one of those things with the tools that are available to you through the county library system uh, and through the Army, uh, you will be able to potentially locate at least more information on that individual. Now, the one thing I will say, uh, especially if you're into genealogy and you're used to looking at more of the 19th century of things, the Civil War, War of 1812, things like that, uh, you won't find the same National Archives availability of uh, service records, pension records, or things like that, which, while occasionally difficult to search or use, do exist. Uh, unfortunately, in 1973, there was a massive fire at the National Archives facility in St. Louis, the National Personnel Records Center. Uh, up to, the archives estimates, 80% of Army service records from 1912 to 1960 burned overnight. Um, it was a massive fire. The St. Louis Fire Department and districts and volunteer fire departments all around the area fought it. And in fact, they were still having to keep water on that floor for months afterwards because of the intensity of the heat. So the RA National Archives do have records from that time period, morning reports, which were units, daily records of who was present, who was absent. And they do have monthly returns same information, but it's on a monthly basis for regular Army units um, from 19-teens, 20s, and 30s, uh, and into the early 40s. But a lot of those records are going to have to turn to these secondary sources. Newspapers, census records, um, unit histories, and things like that. Uh, one other secondary source I'll mention, talking about these distinctive insignia on the shoulder. This one I just so happened I was familiar with, but they almost all have mottos or distinctive designs to them. And there are sources both online and in print, uh, the American Society of Military Insignia Collectors, it's a mouthful, ASMIC, uh, has a publication, you can get it through interlibrary loan, again, the library system here, uh, that is the motto catalog or motto list. Uh, it's a two-volume set that lists all of the United States Army's different distinctive insignias with their mottos that usually go across the bottom. And volume two covers the ones that don't have mottos by their distinctive designs on the shield. So that can be a big help in discovering what exactly you have. Um, that covers most of what we have to talk about today here, uh, about sort of comparing and contrasting the availability of information as well as the difference between officers and enlisted men's uniforms. Uh, so we hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, we hope uh, that you'll join us again in the future for more of our uh, historic presentations.